Hello, friends of BIS. This is Narsim Harao, class of 85. And it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you a little bit about my life and career. I'm currently an associate professor at the Yale School of the Environment, focusing on energy systems and understanding the role between society and the environment, particularly climate change. So how did I get here? Well, I used to take the school bus to BIS back in the day from Bandra, which in those days was a distant suburb. And I remember looking out of the window in the school bus and seeing the poverty, the slums and the squalor. And of course, this is commonplace for people in Mumbai, but I could never quite get my head around it. Why did we have this kind of poverty and why were we so blasé about it? But these thoughts just mulled in the back of my mind as I grew up. And I pursued the conventional aspirations of, you know, privileged Indians. I applied to go abroad. I studied engineering, like all good boys who do well in science and math, and took up a job. And it wasn't until much later, when I was a reasonably successful energy professional in my early 30s, when I decided to act on my conscience. So I was recently married and didn't have any other attachments. And we decided to pack our bags and move back to India. I wanted to get involved with all of the reforms that were happening in the energy sector and really understand how it affects the public interest and, and economic development. And that was a really formative experience for me. Uh, I took a 95% pay cut, got a position as a visiting professor at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore and the Center for Public Policy. And I had uh, many, many interesting experiences. For example, I was an expert consultant to the Indian government for the famous Enron Power Project. And that really opened my eyes as to how the politics of the energy sector works. I also had some amusing experiences. Um, I had to take the GREs when I decided I wanted to apply for a PhD and go back to become an academic. And I had to take the GREs alongside some of my students at IIM. Perhaps not as amusing was on the flight back, the flight attendant mistook my wife for my daughter as she lay her head on my shoulder and slept peacefully on the flight. In any case, one of the influential figures in my life in Bangalore was a professor from the Indian Institute of Science, Amulya Reddy, who told me that if you want to work on finding energy solutions for the poor, for understanding poverty, you have to visit people and learn about it firsthand. Not only does it give you credibility, but it also gives you invaluable insights into the ways of life of people. And indeed it did. I want to share one such story with you. So during my dissertation, I was doing some field work in rural Maharashtra. Uh, this was deep in the Ahmednagar district, uh, about five hours drive from Pune, where people didn't have running water. They had barely eight hours of electricity. People used to use biomass or firewood and dung for cooking at home using chulas or kerosene. And so I was visiting one such household and it was a small sort of thatched roof home. And the person who I interviewed was a, was a worker, a seasonal uh, laborer, daily wage laborer in the sugarcane industry, very poor. And so we were talking, we were sitting on two chairs inside the hut and his wife was on the floor cleaning rice. There was a child running around. And so we started talking and they also used a chulha and a kerosene stove. And I was trying to explain to him how he could take advantage of the ration card to get some savings in his kerosene purchases. And he didn't seem very interested. And then he asked me, why are you doing this research? Do you work for the government? And I said, no, I'm doing my PhD. And when I said that, his and his wife's eyes lit up and froze. She looked up and she pointed to him and signaled towards a bookshelf. He walks up to the bookshelf and he pulls out this fat spiral binder, about 150 pages, and he proudly shows it to me. It's single spaced Marathi text. Apparently it is her master's thesis that she wrote on education. And she is aspiring to get a PhD. And apparently she would travel to Ratnagiri several hours away once every month to do some exa exams so she could prepare for applying for a PhD. And he was using all his money to support her education because he didn't have a college degree himself and he has faced discrimination at all you know at every stage in his life and he understands the value of an education 
And this completely blew my mind and explained why he wasn't interested in discussing kerosene subsidies. And how, how many times does one see this kind of case in India, where you have women in, among the rural poor aspiring for a PhD? How often does one find that a male in Indian society is willing to put the wife's career before them? Uh, the number of stereotypes this broke really amazed me. And I don't know if this was an outlier, it probably was. But in any case, I, over the years, have traveled and understood through surveys different consumption patterns of people in different parts of the world, in Brazil and South Africa, different parts of India, in Nepal. And I have a fairly deep understanding now of consumption patterns. And I've really witnessed this kind of divergence in um, fortunes of people. So there's a growing middle class, the adoption of Western lifestyles and the affluent. At the same time, there's persistent poverty in so many parts of the world. So for instance, I talked about chulas. Well, when I was in Bangalore in 2002, there were about 1 billion people in South Asia, including Pakistan and Bangladesh, who cook with chulas. And that kills about 1 million women and children prematurely every year due to the indoor air pollution caused by the cooking with these stoves. 18 years later today, there are still 1 billion people in South Asia cooking with chulas. How is that possible? We've had you know, upwards of 400 million people in India gain access to LPG cook stoves, gas cook stoves that are clean in the last decade or so. Why is it possible that 1 billion people are still using chulas? Well, for one, a lot of these LPG acquirers don't have the money to buy the fuel, even though they got a free stove. And so they continue using their old chulas. Also, the new acquirers of chulas among the rural poor because of population growth that has outpaced the acquisition of LPG stoves. So this dualism has really run strong in India and many parts of the world. And it's not only about divergent fortunes, it's also about the impact of the affluence consumption on the poor. So for instance, with air pollution, uh, we did a study where we looked at all the different sources of air pollution. So we have chulas, but we also have vehicles and transport, we have industry, and we tried to understand who's contributing to this air pollution by tracing back based on the footprint, the consumption footprint of people, the indirect emissions caused by the manufacturing of the products they consume, as well as the cars that they drive. And then on the other side, looking at who's affected, who's vulnerable and being killed uh, or face the risks of being killed by this air pollution. And we found that the rural poor in India, after taking into account how population is distributed, where all the sources of pollution are, how the air flows are across India. We found that the rural poor are exposed to a disproportionate share of air pollution outside their homes from our consumption, in addition to the risks that they face from using chulas inside their homes. So this pollution, this is a form of pollution export in a way, right? And it also reflects in climate change. So I'm a contributing author to the scientific assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And several reports in the past have consistently shown that the worst effects of climate change will be felt by the people who contribute the least to it. Whereas people in the middle and upper classes who are contributing to emissions through their consumption are relatively unaffected by the effects of climate change. For instance, let's think about heat stress. So climate change has been increasing average temperatures and there are already tens of thousands of people who die from heat stress. And air conditioning is a luxury in India. Although in many temperate parts of in, uh, tropical parts of the world like in Singapore and Malaysia or warm parts of the United States and Europe, most people own air conditioners, including the poor. So it's currently a luxury item in India and we expect that with income growth by 2050, there'll be upwards of half a billion people in India who own air conditioners. But those air conditioners, by virtue of their energy use, are contributing to climate change. And there are the other half billion people in India who face the same weather conditions, but who can't afford to have air conditioners. And so they suffer the effects of heat stress. So really, I've learned a lot about the strong interdependence in society of people, especially through their consumption and through the effect of the, on the environment. This all may sound gloomy. It is a reality, however. But the converse of this is that the solutions are also about reducing this dualism between the affluence and poverty. So I've got a pretty clear vision now after all these years of research about what society needs to look like to combat climate change. 
And of course, we need uh, some kind of convergence internationally where advanced low carbon technologies become affordable uh, and so therefore can be diffused and adopted across countries like India. Just the same way that solar photovoltaics, you know, the panels that convert solar energy to electricity, those have now become affordable in India and competitive with coal. We need that to happen for a host of other low carbon technologies. But there's a lot that we can do in India in the absence of advanced technologies that can improve the lives of people and reduce our emissions growth. One striking example of this is public transportation. So one of the most energy intensive activities and fastest growing is transport. And if we were to shift to public transportation, especially in the new and emerging cities of India to avoid the growth of car dependence, we would reduce air pollution, reduce congestion, create more opportunities for mobility for poorer people who tend to use public transit. And because it's so much more efficient than a car dependent economy, we would significantly reduce our emissions growth. And this is just but one example. More broadly speaking, a society that has combated the worst effects of climate change and mitigated climate change significantly is one, we really, is one where we really would have reduced this dualism between the affluent and the poor by improving the resilience of the poor to be able to deal with the effects of extreme events and by reducing our contribution to climate change from our uh, consumption. So over all these years, I look back and I feel that I have actually got some answers to the questions that I asked in that school bus many years ago. And I've learned many important lessons. One of them is it's so important to find and follow one's passion, no matter how late it is. I'm so grateful for having done that myself to becoming an academic. I've also learned it's so important to be humble, curious, and skeptical, because this is a very complex world and we cannot overestimate the extent to which we have our, an impact on the world, both positive and negative, through our own consumption, but also through the choices we make for our livelihood. So I look back on the education I had. I think that BIS has played a major role uh, for me. It, 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 the education that I got opened up choices and opportunities for me that sets us apart from so many people in this world. And I think it's so important that we use our skills and passions to meet the needs of the world. And I hope the younger generations of people in BIS do the same. And um, I certainly felt that I'm grateful for that every day. I see my education as being a privilege that I appreciate in my life. So thank you for listening. Be well, be safe. If you have questions, please do reach out to me. Thank you very much for listening.